Good evening. We'll call to order Monday, December the 5th, um, meeting of the Court of Madera Parks and Recreation Commission. Please stand and salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Rebecca, will you please do roll call? Commissioner Brown, did she join us? She is absent. Commissioner Elson? Here. Commissioner Kennick? Here. Commissioner Phipps? Is absent. Commissioner Rose? Present. Commissioner Blumling? Is absent. Vice Chair Charlie? Here. And Chair Miles? Here. Thank you. Um, before we start with the items on our agenda, we'll open for public comment. There is no one here in the public. Is there anyone online or any emailed public comments? I do not believe we have received any emailed public comments, but I am seeing one raised hand from an online attendee. So I will call on Patty uh, while I check the public comment email. Hello, Patty, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I was uh, attending the um, public health meeting for the um, nonprofits this morning and they mentioned that they had a lot of um, self tests for COVID to give away. And I wondered if you were handing them out at the front desk at the rec center. That's all. COVID tests are available um, by request at the community center. And I just checked the public comment at tcmail.org and we did not receive any email to public comments. Since there are no other <clears throat> public comments, we will close public comment this time and move to presentations. So today we have our mid-year budget update uh, from Rochelle. Thanks, Ash. Good evening, everyone. Um, here I am to talk about where we are, uh, although we're not quite where we're supposed to be because it's not December 31st, so that would technically be the mid-year. Um, but I did put together a spreadsheet um, just to sort of give you an idea of the beginning uh, of what we thought was going to happen. So that would be what we projected the total expense and revenue and the net would be and where we are as of November 30th uh, in revenue and expense and the total net. So the last three columns is where we are right now. Um, at this point in the fiscal year, we would expect that we would be 50% of expense used and 50% of revenue in. Um, and we're about there in a lot of places. Um, it has been a little bit difficult to see, to get a trend for what's happening because of the years that we had COVID and the years before that where the record keeping wasn't quite what I would have expected. Um, so we did go back and take a look at sort of trends when we were setting this budget up back last year and used it as a springboard and it basically did my best guess about what I thought might happen um, without having a lot of background, honestly, um, to be able to make an informed um, kind of scheme of where we were, but we did the best we could. Um, and uh, at this point, it looks like um, what we thought was gonna happen was we were gonna kind of be at break even. And I know later you guys are gonna be talking a little bit about um, the other part of this, which is, cost recovery. Um, so when I made the budget originally and I met with Daria to go over it, we thought that we were going to be at about break even. Um, it turns out that 
once again, I was, I underestimated sort of where the revenue was going to be. I mean, it's really difficult when you haven't had people in the buildings, you haven't had people in programs <laughs> to be able to make an informed um, decision about what you think is going to happen. So it is sort of a guess. Um, we did take all the money that used to come from the general fund and put it directly into operations and administration, which was uh, Daria's recommendation for that. But everything else is what we what we thought might happen um, based on what's happened the last couple of years and sort of trying to split the difference. Um, so just to go down a little bit down the list, facility rentals has been a bit slow on the bounce back. People are still not super comfortable coming into the building um, when there's a lot of other people. And it's interesting because we just had the opening of the gallery in the building last weekend and there were still people wearing masks, which um, I know that COVID is still here and I'm not trying to be cavalier about it, but I was actually kind of surprised because there wasn't that many people. Um, and it did, it does hammer home a little bit that people are still a bit nervous to come have big events in the building. So that's gonna, I feel like be a little more gradual than we had hoped. Um, normally between rentals and classes, um, you know, they have a really bustling business. And I know rentals in the past have been really, really busy. Um, we did come up with a projected revenue that was lower um, and they're not I mean, they're not at 50% at all yet. So um, I think, you know, going forward, um, we might dial back on that just a little bit just because we don't really have a solid base for um, of numbers that we think could happen in the future. Um, recreation operations is where they put the money that used to be transferred in. They made it part of the budget for us. Um, and so you can see that in department 80, there's not revenue attached to that at all. It's all direct transfer from the general fund. Um, so the big areas for us are contract classes, which right now um, is making up about 300, a little over 300,000. At this point in the year, we would expect it to only be at maybe a $200,000. So they're doing really well. And I can attribute that to the after school classes that are happening on site at the school sites um, are doing really, really well. People um, definitely, there's a, there's a need for that and a desire for something other than childcare, which is also doing well. I'm not trying to say that, but some people prefer after school classes and those are doing very, very, well. Adult classes are a little bit lower and we don't separate them out for you, but it's about a quarter of the amount of money that comes in in contract classes would be adult classes, not seniors, just general adult classes. So the lion's share of that money is going to be after school enrichment kind of classes. Um, our sports program this year is really, really doing well. The soccer program, um, they did raise rates last year a bit. They're still in the in the middle to lower end of what clubs are in Marin. Um, we did a survey of all of them and, and we are a bit lower. There were a lot more kids who made um, the select teams and those teams cost more money. So they bring in more money. Um, they also cost more to staff because you have to have actual coaching daily, which is um, expensive. Um, but still, in terms of revenue and expense, that program is doing really well in covering all those costs. And we last year, I believe it was about 125000 that our department kept, which would pay for field rental, um, you know, us to register everyone and follow up on paperwork and all those kind of behind the scenes stuff. Although the fields, I guess, aren't really behind the scenes, but um, but uh, it's definitely covering costs. And and right now, if the season ended today and we weren't doing anything in the spring, um, our department is about one hundred and fifty thousand of profit from that, which is great. Um, and those programs are, you know, huge for the community as well. I mean, we definitely see some people from outside the community that are taking advantage, but I would bet that most kids that play soccer from Corte Madera are in the program, which is excellent. Um, summer camp is the next one. Um, we had a little lower summer camp registration than I know that we're used to in Corte Madera because we used to run a much larger program. Um, we did add, um, a component where we were helping out kids who are lower income kids who are in summer school. So we were taking them after summer school for just a part day. Um, that money has not been transferred into that account yet. And when that happens, there'll be a little bit more flesh. We also have two more weeks of summer camp. 
this year that'll go into this fiscal year and the rest of the summer will go into the next one. So they that program should be fine um, and, and we'll have summer school at some point next summer. They haven't solidified dates for that as well. But in the summertime, we have in the fiscal year, if you look at it, how it starts on July 1st, we have maybe six weeks of camp and then school starts. And then we have two more weeks in June and that's the end of the year. So we still have some revenue that will be collected then. Um, active Older Adults um, is a program that uh, Perry is involved in. And um, that program right now is kind of a break even point, which is fabulous. That's excellent. Doesn't happen that way often. Um, and then the recreation administration account is all of the administrative staff. Again, there's a uh, revenue for attached to that, but not a whole lot. It's the scholarship money that gets put into that account that will get distributed out later. Um, community events. Uh, we have some event, we've had some events this year come up and that program right now is kind of at a break even. Um, so that's excellent. And then childcare, which um, has had, a lot of success last year and is continuing their full. They also are a bit, I'm, they're not understaffed, they're adequately staffed, but they're not overstaffed. So their, their, break in, their break even point is much better because we're not overstaffed, um, and, but we have lots of kids who are in the program and also taking advantage of some of the after school classes and playing soccer. So they're kind of involved in a lot. The people that are using childcare uh, are really happy with the program and their program's doing really well at this point. So at this point in the year, we it, if we ended the year today, we'd be super happy because we'd be up $360,000. That's not going to hold. Last year, we ended the year at $73,000 over uh, budget, which is great. That's better than break even, which is awesome and be great if that happens every year. And that's certainly what we're striving for and what we're what we're counting on happening um, because of cost recovery. And hopefully we'll talk more about that in a little while. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them for you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, commissioner, questions before we go to public comment, please. I just want to clarify for my own brain. When you say end the year, you're talking about fiscal year, not yes. calendar year. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fiscal year will end for us on July 30th. Our system, our computer system does not um, have a mechanism for ending the year and starting the new year. So uh, in June, I'll be back to, <laughs> to make sure all that money that we're collecting in this fiscal year for next fiscal year gets pushed forward. Um, otherwise it messes up our whole budget. So I'll make sure that that happens again. And uh, it's, it's been fine for the past two years. So we'll be, we should be okay. But yeah, the end year will end on July, uh, sorry, June 30th. So assuming, because life is usually not this way, that this isn't necessarily, you know, the expenses and revenue aren't necessarily linear. Mm -hmm. So in comparing like to like, for the last year where we ended up about at 70 something thousand, when you did the mid year, that year, where about were we? Well, so that was hard because that was the first year I had done the budget. And and before, prior to me doing it the way I, the only way I can understand it is splitting it out by divisions. Before it was just like, the department needs to bring in this much money and the department can spend that much money. So it was a little bit different and we added childcare. That was the difficulty. Um, this year, it's I, th I, you know, it's a little. I'm a little more closer to close to it because I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, but there's always surprises, and I think to me, the biggest surprise is how much revenue is coming from classes. I mean, I think that's pretty extraordinary, um, especially the second year of doing after school classes. I think there's a level of trust that happens, um, and people realize that these are really effective programs that are right on school campus. And it just adds an extra layer of safety and protection, but also enrichment for the kids. And I think um, once you start, once you have a year behind you, people get kind of a little more on board. Um, so hopefully, I mean, hopefully these numbers are going to hold, um, but I, you know, never say never, I, I guess. The course selection is great. I think Aaron's doing an amazing job finding people to do that. Um, where does the excess money go? Uh, the plan, it goes back into the general fund at this point. So typically if any of the departments and municipalities um, have a revenue, it goes back into the general fund. And then kind of, you know, asking kind of to, to make sure that both the commission and, and the public are aware, we things like 
um, heat for the building and upkeep of the community center, the folks who are maintaining the grass and all of that, that's not in these budget numbers. No. So that is in excess and that's managed Correct. by the town typically? Yes. So we have accounts that are um, that, that come directly from the general fund. So anything that's going to be like a direct cost for the field maintenance, that's going to be coming through public works. So we don't have a way to measure that. Um, we could probably come, I'm sure RJ could come up with an extensive way to do so. Um, I'm not sure that would be a, to a benefit to what we're looking for. Um, also, we have mm-hmm. things like cleaning services or... Um, some of our utilities, those all come from the general funds. And this is helpful as we think about some of the the things that we've been tasked with understanding how that plays into where funding might come from um, and who would need to be involved. Uh, We go beyond things that aren't on here. We're not talking about programs and classes. We're definitely talking about town council involvement um, and definitely other sources of revenue um, for things like pools. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think just kind of calling this out here that we're talking about, you know, kind of a revenue budget just under $2 million. That's certainly not going to fund a $20 million pool. Mm-hmm. That would be amazing. There's a lot of ukulele classes. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions from the commission on this? Thank you, Rochelle. Um, any public comment? just refreshing the public comment email and I'm not seeing any emailed public comment and we do not have any hands raised from online attendees at this time. So I think we can move on to our second business item, the annual program report. Let me just get my screen share here. All right. And just to kind of preface this um, this presentation, it's, this is more of kind of like our photo slide share um, of the year. Um, so this is taking out, we're not gonna be throwing out a bunch of numbers today. It's really just kind of celebrating some of the successes in illustrated format um, through other reports. We've provided numbers of summer camp, numbers of participation types of classes. So hopefully tonight you just um, appreciate seeing some of the recap and seeing some of familiar faces in our slideshow. All right, so our goals to go back was um, communication programs and services and planning. Those were our three focus areas. So communication, we had our activity guide. Those are cover images at the top there. We had our printed school menus, um, two samples at the bottom. Our social media, if anybody hasn't joined, um, followed our Facebook page, uh, Christina does a fabulous job in making um, animated uh, ads. So they're really cool. Um, unfortunately, I'm not technologically enough savvy to be putting those in here, but they move, they bounce, that they're, they're really interesting. So please follow us on Facebook. Um, Aaron controls MailChimp emails. So those usually focus on three different highlight things to share, whether it be a registration for classes or activity or event coming up. And those go to um, all the participants or anyone who has participated and is in our Rec Pro um, database. Um, we have our website, which we're constantly updating. We have different pages on there from current activities and events to our homepage, usually having top um, top activities and what's coming up. Um, we have the town's newsletter. Um, usually we have um, at the top of that of our section in there, just kind of things that are happening now and events that are coming up. Um, we're constantly working on our relationships, not only with the school district and the town of Larkspur, um, but with other relationships we've built through CPRS that you see the logo down there. That's the California Parks and Recreation Society. Um, that's how we collaborate with some of our um, colleague agencies so that we're not reinventing the wheel and we're pooling like-minded um, and like actions. Um, and that's also employee engagement and training. We really try to build those relationships between our neighboring agencies and throughout the state because it gives us a better idea of programming trends, um, troubleshooting challenges that come up, um, and then really focusing on encouraging our team to go to trainings that are not only offered through CPRS, but other um, areas of interest. Programs and services, we have classes, programs, community events, and activities. So there's a little sample imaging here. Again, with classes, we're we're focusing on quality and variety programs, focusing on fun, safe, and affordable um, community events, inclusive and collaborative, and activities um, where we want to find engaging and unique activities. 
So classes and programs, um, after school programs at Neil Cummins in the Cove, um, youth programs um, operated at the community center, dance room, Neil Cummins and Town Park. In case you didn't know, we do offer classes on Friday evenings and Saturday mornings at Neil Cummins in the portables. Um, and those are kind of highlighted towards our tweens and our teen ages, um, which is a tough demographic to market to, but we've got um, games and we've got Dungeons and Dragons and really interesting stuff. Um, adults, we have activities at the community center, the dance room and town park, and then active older adults and seniors. Most of those classes are at the community center. But again, um, those programs can overlap with the, with the regular adult classes or typical adult classes. So it'd be our watercolor class and things like that that can operate at both the community center and in the dance studio. Youth programs, uh, fun, safe, and affordable. Um, we have their three main areas. That's Corte Madeira Children's Center, um, our after-school program, um, Camp Corte Madeira for the summer day camp, and then Corte Madeira Football Club, our soccer program. And again, soccer is spring clinics, um, two weeks of summer camps, and then both the fall recreational league and the fall competitive league. And adult athletic programs, uh, we have adult softball, which we've actually been contracting through the ranch, which is the Tiburon um, Belvedere uh, Recreation, and they've been uh, organizing our teams. And um, that's a picture of the Mill Valley Blues, which happens to be their name of their team. They are a Corte Madeira team. Um, and those are pictures of our two courts. So we've got uh, Town Park on the left and Granada on the right there, and encouragement to buy a tennis key. Um, just the only random number I'll throw out there is that our tennis key sales were 230 this year. So when it comes later, when we talk about the fee study, um, the fee schedule and the possibility of renting courts right now, it's um, I advise to not do so because we really want to make those available for a public drop in use. Because right now it's hard when we have pickleball. Um, we only have the uh, the courts on the left hand side temporarily marked for pickleball. So it gets it gets pretty crowded out there. We have a very popular pickleball class. Um, classes and programs for active older adults. Um, in our activity guides, we have the little um, grid there for a week at a glance, which shows, um, which hopefully gets people involved in multiple days of week, different things of interest from chair yoga to bridge. We have introduction bridge. We have um, seniors in movement in balance. We've got our Carol Butler's tap, which is hiding underneath the upper right-hand corner. And then um, a special thing that we collaborate with Cheryl Longinati in the bottom right-hand corner for uh, senior light tours. So that's uh, going on, I believe now uh, for the next two weeks. And then we have our programs that are designated for adults with developmental disabilities, which is Rec Inc. and volunteers of all ability levels. We have a lot of student and family volunteers that join those. Um, again, third, third Friday dances, basketballs on Mondays, party nights, sports night, Lions Club meetings, uh, movie and mall nights annually. Um, and then they do some special events during the holidays. Um, and there's a couple of images to share. Just They've got an amazing turnout this year, especially starting with the Halloween dance. And they're really anticipating a huge crowd for uh, for the holiday dance because those have been Zoom and those are um, super popular in general. And uh, the volunteers love to do it because it requires dressing up and things like that. Um, we've got a lot of community events. When I tried to um, to put them all on one page, obviously we had to get, sh get <laughs> shrink down. Um, but this is one of the things that we really wanted to focus on coming from the feedback through the, um, the needs assessment part of the master plan is that people really wanted opportunity to come and engage, um, get together, but they wanted not only events that had an event element, but they wanted to have food paired with it, music. So one of the things we focused on with our two movies, um, movie and movies was that we added music. Uh, so we had live music before each one of them. We, um, had food elements. So the first one we had, um, nothing bunt cakes. And the second one we had a taco truck and nothing bunt cakes. And the second one we, well, we balanced it. So we had the first one at uh, town park. So for the West side, and then moving over to the East side for Cove park, and then collaborating with the Cove PTA. And hopefully that's a relationship that we can build and continue on with both of the schools. If we pair it with the schools, then they saved the Cove um, had ran like a popcorn sales. And it was really nice to, to bring the kids down. And that happened to be the first week of school, which was a good, good timing for that. But we found in the bottom right-hand corner there, and that image was the um, kind of the kickoff family dance party in the park, which was um, actually from a DJ that reached out to us that grew up in the community and wanted to just give it back for free. So he kind of kicked us off um, in May, which is really awesome. So uh, DJ C and his sister is actually the one that does the DJing for our Rec Inc. dances. 
So they're a great family to work with. Again, creating those relationships that people want to come back and give back to our community, which is really great. Um, working with uh, Twin Cities to do an egg hunt. Um, so we worked with Nick at Larkspur Recreation and we hosted in Town Park. Um, I guess traditionally we'd gone back and forth. So one year Larkspur would host and, this, and then the next year Corner Meter would host. Um, this next year we're planning on hosting um, together again that uh, Larkspur will do a Friday evening um, flashlight tag for the older kids and then flashlight hunt, egg hunt for the older kids. And then we'll have the traditional egg hunt um, on Saturday morning in Town Park. So it's nice to collaborate with our neighbors on that. Um, but the Outdoor Family Dance Night plein air, which is a painting event. We actually did that with the Outdoor Family Dance Night. So we had watercolorists and oil and acrylic um, artists went out and painted for about four hours in the park and then came out and we showed the the, the all of the um, the work. So you can see the, the blue ribbon one there, the work um, at the dance party and people, you know, cheered and got to recognize them. It was really great. Um, Fourth of July, we supported the kids area. So we've got the, uh, the kids playing Jenga, uh, big band dances. They resumed in May. Um, so that's an ongoing um, monthly activity minus I think they take off in either August or July. Um, we had a pumpkin carving dance night. Um, so we combined two events. So we had the pumpkin carving, which was new. And one of the most, uh, the best feedback was come that we had staff that were actually hollowing out the pumpkins. So uh, parents and parents and friends enjoyed that. But there was kind of like an all family. So uh, Christina led that event and she had a bunch of tables that were, you know, pre-wrapped, ready for us to clean up after, after the families they could carve with tools that we had there. There was, you know, the the uh, the mallets that you could do punched out shapes. Then there was a separate area that was kind of quieter behind um, behind the fireplace that had an area for the kids to paint pumpkins or just color. Um, so she really thought about kind of the all age groups for that. Um, and then we we had everything decorated and that went right into about half an hour in between going into the rec ink dance. So we had that overlap where families got to see um, all the participants of the rec ink dance come in. They could stay for a little bit. They could dance a little bit. But it was a really nice kind of um, cross pollination of those two programs and awareness. And then we had the family roundup dance. Um, and we'll have the second family dance in um, March. So that'll be more of like a spring fling dress up sweetheart dance style. So hopefully that'll appeal to um, former participants of getting dressed up and going out, you know, replacing the traditional daddy daughter or mother son dances. Um, Thanksgiving Day Turkey Trot, we collaborated with the um, community group that normally puts it on. So it's just a couple of volunteers that have done been doing a fabulous job for the last few years. Um, and we kind of helped um, provide a little bit more of the, the support for filling out um, permits for, you know, encouragement permits for Larkspur or filling out our special event permit and providing tables and sound system and just adding that element of support so that the community members could really enjoy it. And we had a great turnout. We had a perfect day. Um, art receptions. Uh, we have the current art reception right now. Um, we had one last December and then this December now is opened um, on Saturday. So it's been really great feedback coming through. We had about 100 people come through on Saturday and we'll have a closing reception on Thursday the 15th um, and hopefully everyone can come. Uh, we have close to 50 adult artists um, in the show. We also have one youth artist that's in the show as, an, as a I think it's an acrylic painting. And then we have 16 posters of the winners for the painted bins. And that was from Neil Cummins Elementary School. So it was really great to have all of those families come in at the beginning of, of the reception. And then coming up, we have the gingerbread house workshop. So Christina, who also organized the pumpkin carving is gonna be doing the gingerbread house workshop. And that's in two weeks, I believe. All right, and activities. Again, we wanted to have them engaging and unique. So we had a community ofrenda, a giving tree, which was um, leaves of gratitude. And at the Thanksgiving turkey trot, we filled out, that was the last chance to fill out kind of a leave of gratitude. And those were all hung in the lobby. We have a one warm coat drive happening right now, as well as letters to Santa. Um, and then we have the holiday home decorating contest with the chamber. And then kind of activities slash ongoing events as we have the art um, exhibition plus the reception events. Um, we do have gallery hours for the show that's installed right now. And then again, the big, big band dances, since that's kind of a monthly event. So, and then moving into our planning, we've been doing a lot of work with our master plan project. Um, last year, we closed out with um, community feedback. Um, and we had January, we hosted 
um, the public engagement meetings via Zoom. And then um, now we're into the conditions assessments. And then hopefully um, next early next year, we'll be able to present some actual um, results to the commission and then going to council with um, some, prior, some prioritization and some monetary um, assignments with it so that council can really make a decision on how they want to move forward with strategic planning for the next 10 years for our department. Um, Town Park Restroom Project, um, we are working with Public Restroom Company to come up with a couple of designs um, for us to review at the commission level in January. And then to go forward, we would be going through the Planning Commission for review before going to council. Um, uh, emergency planning with the county. Last year, we worked closely with the county to identify um, different facilities in our area um, between Parks and Rec and the schools and what kind of facilities could be used for what, whether it be um, an operational center versus um, a shelter. So we're working with the county on that, um, giving all of our blueprints of our buildings and having them be able to assess what's, the, what's needs for our community based on what kind of emergency or disaster planning they're gonna be doing. Um, agreements and collaborations, again, continuing to find ways to collaborate with not only PTA, PTO groups, but um, the city of Larkspur, um, other neighboring agencies, with the ranch, uh, Mill Valley, we're really, um, we're really close to our neighboring agencies. Obviously, we, com we communicate a lot with the Larkspur and San Anselmo uh, recreation departments because we're all under the jurisdiction of um, Central Marine Police Authority, so it's really helpful. Um, streamlines some of that collaboration and is kind of providing them to be able to support us. And then um, continue to, to move forward on um, updating our policies and procedures and making um, uh, processes efficient. So for one example is um, some of our permitting processes are just really outdated and we can kind of go through that and just make it a little bit more usable. We can create templates for closures of Minky Park, say for concert series or create um, a system uh, that people can organize a block party more simply. And then staffing, we're always looking for a great staff. Part-time staff are really hard to find and we really wanna uh, make sure that we're perpetuating the, the great staff that we have with our youth programs, but also at the front desk and uh, facility attendance and some um, event support. And then this is my thank you um, to my staff is you continue to demonstrate versatility, resilience, and positive positivity in the workplace of constant change. Celebrate each of our successes and look forward to seeing what we will accomplish next. Um, and this is similar to what I had said last year. Um, and it is like my staff constantly surprise surprise and impress me. We all come from very different viewpoints and we all have different strengths and together, um, you know, we're stronger together. Uh, we constantly are creating you know, more things to create opportunities for engagement and customer service. And those are our priorities. What's next for Parks and Rec? We're almost done. Next year, simplified community building, events and collaborations, communication and marketing, programs and services to improve field maintenance strategies, improved forms and permits and updating um, our policies and procedures, and then FARDA's planning, um, our master plan project, and the town park restroom project. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I think it's really exciting, and I'm, I'm encouraged by things like the turkey trout, which is this kind of uh, collaboration between a community group and Parks and Rec. I participated. It was really fun, um, but it's such a great way for us to continue to build on it. We have a small team and a small budget, and the more we can connect with these community groups and with our fellow communities, it kind of helps amplify the whole thing. So it's awesome that that is part of your um, marching marching forward um, into next year and looking for those ways to kind of continue to make it easy for folks to collaborate with the, with the department and with other departments. Any other comments or questions? And I realize... Parts of my things have been updated, but that one still says 2021. It should say 2022. <laughs> I actually, I have a question, um, Ashley. Thank you for the report. That was awesome. It was a really kind of, it was fun to think back of the events of the year. Um, in terms of the newer events, like the movie nights and the family dance party, and actually in the family roundup, I'm curious what attendance was like in comparison, particularly like the dance setting. Was that what attendance was like compared to previous, um, the more traditional dances, and then also just what the attendance was for the um, outdoor park events. The outdoor park events, it's hard for me to monetize the, um, looking at a crowd and, and figuring out how many people are there is definitely sure. not my strength. <laughs> um, 
I, I was very pleased by the number of people that came out to the outdoor dance party. Again, for that event, particularly, we only provided the only cost out for us was providing free pizza and, and drinks and salads and things like that. Um, the DJ services were donated, like I mentioned, um, the movies and uh, music. Um, again, we had the expense of putting out the paying the bands and, and doing the screens and the rental of the movie. Um, but that wasn't our intention to get donations. We sold little tchotchkes that light up just to kind of tie with the theme of the movie. Like in Kanto, we had the light up butterflies and things like that. It's just really about the community building for us. But I think that we had, it's hard to say it, maybe the, maybe the town park one, we had probably at least a hundred people. Um, and then we probably had like more like 200 for the dance party, the family dance party. And then we had more people, I think, attend over at the, um, at the Cove, because that was a good time because we had the PTO involved. So they, and it was the first week of school rather than mm -hmm. the middle of summer when people might've been traveling. So again, we probably had more than a hundred. Um, but the whole thing is that, you know, when people are attended and, you know, you see them smiling and they're dancing and the kids are engaged. That was really what the whole thing was about. Um, when we touched on the indoor dances, the family um, roundup, um, the whole format changed. So it's really kind of hard. We we had a low, a turn, low turnout. I didn't want to cancel it because I really wanted to um, wanted people to see what we had planned for it and what the new look of the event would be. And hopefully by word of mouth that that would help for for March. But really, we'll have to see in March and March attendance wise. Uh, we didn't offer food, um, a dinner like it had done prior because we'd heard not only we wanted to be safe with COVID and just kind of reduce that kind of um, activity, um, but some people liked the food, some people didn't like the food. So we just focused on on dessert and kind of appetizers. So again, it's kind of a different format and we'll see mm -hmm. in March whether it's something we want to continue. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any public comment? We did not receive any email to public comment on this item, and I do not see any raised hands from attendees. Ashley, that is the extent of our presentation. So we're moving on to the consent calendar. Um, these are items that are routine or have been previously discussed and do not require any further discussion. Any member of the public is welcome to comment or pull an item from the consent calendar for further discussion. We'll start by asking anyone from the commission would like to pull something from the consent calendar? Is there any public comment regarding the consent calendar? We did not receive any emailed public comment on the consent calendar, and I do not see any uh, raised hands from attendees. Right now, it's back to the commission for a possible motion. Would anyone like to move to approve the consent calendar? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Yes. yes. Second. Second. Excellent. Rebecca, can we have a vote, please? Commissioner Brown, Commissioner Elson? Yes. Commissioner Kennig? Yes. Commissioner Phipps? Commissioner Rose? Yes. Commissioner Blumling? Vice Chair Charlie? Chair Miles? Yes. All right, moving on to business items. Ashley, the review of possible recommendation to the town council to adopt a resolution formalizing a revised parks and recreation fee schedule. Thank you. Um, to remind the commission that last year we talked about this um, item in two different meetings. Um, and the reason that we did that is that we really went through it in detail, the resolution. Um, I found that I'm recommending that we only discuss it once this year because I think we really had some thorough discussions last time. And we've made just very minimal changes that I'd like to focus on this time um, with the addition of, um, let's see here, we had recreation soccer fees. And we have, and then we have the introduction of um, our scholarship as a part of this fee discussion, as well as the introduction of discussion. Hopefully the commission would like to um, discuss some of our cost um, recovery analysis and possibly setting a goal going forward. So kind of itemizing through the uh, staff report, we have reference to the prior um, staff reports and the approved resolution, which is uh, number 03200022. And that link is available in the staff report. 
Um, the discussion tonight is asked to review and discuss the proposed um, recreation fee schedule and draft resolution. That's in attachment one. And those changes are highlighted in red and provide input and direction to staff regarding the items that could potentially be increased or decreased, added or removed, or areas that you'd like to have additional information or comparative analysis performed. To consolidate content, um, just a note to, from the prior fee schedule, I did delete columns for fiscal years um, 2010 to 2011 and 2013 to 2014. And the areas of discussion this evening um, are section two, which is the uh, residence. So I wanted to make sure that we had that in there just as a, we go through it, that residence is defined as is individuals who reside in or groups or organizations which have their principal place of business with either the town of Cordonera limits, city limits of Larkspur or attendees of Larkspur Cordobadera School District. Um, and staff makes no recommendation for change on that. Um, would the chair like me to read, go through this or how would we like to kind of look over this, this staff report? I think there's quite a lot of detail to read through here. Perhaps we can go to the um, chart and cover the details there. Is that okay with the mm -hmm. balance of mission? Great. Right. You're saying going to the resolution? Um, into the, this, the, this. Yep. Let me schedule. pull that up on my screen. So if anybody's watching or watching the recording, it makes it easier for them to do so. for the uh, motion sickness on me scrolling down for anybody watching. Okay, moving into the draft resolution, you can see on the far right-hand column is the um, red proposed for fiscal year 23-24. And you can see that there's no changes recommended until we reach um, the program category, which is in orange header. And that's where we add the Cordomadero Football Club uh, Fall Recreation League. And we have um, grades K through four resident, um, then non-resident, and then grades five through 12, which is MISA, and then the resident and non-resident rates based on that. And we also have an attachment to the staff report, um, our benchmarking of other clubs. We'll kind of see where we can fall on that. Find that one here. And that's gonna be in attachment two is the benchmarking. You can see the, the clubs that we surveyed, um, these are non-municipality organized clubs. Um, many traditionally, I reached out to a number of agencies that I, I'm familiar with having a large um, athletics components to their curriculum. And um, some agencies say um, City of Benicia will run their youth um, basketball league, um, but they do not run a competitive league. So for our purposes of the fee schedule discussion is that we're recommending only introducing the fees for the recreation league because competitive leagues are generally run by um, private organizations for profit. So there's not um, adequate benchmarking for us to include those fees. And they're really contingent on the training costs, um, the tournaments that they go to. So we felt like it wasn't a good thing to be adding to our fee schedule at this time. And so we did pull um, Mill Valley, uh, Miller Creek, which is San Rafael, Novato, Ross Valley, San Anselmo, um, San Rafael, and the Tiburon Peninsula. And the format and the recreation soccer will remain the same where there is a professional trainer during the week and a parent coach on the weekends. Yeah, it's no format changes. And the increase in fee is, is the opportunity to align more with Mill Valley and Tiburon? It's, it's the opportunity to align more. And right now, um, like staffing anywhere, it's really hard to attract and retain um, qualified instructors and trainers. So we found that that cost has gone up a lot as well as the, the people that are organizing and doing a lot of the legwork for the club. 
Uh, so this is less reflective because I'm going back to it for Sheldon. Wouldn't it seem that that's the area that needs it? It's more reflective of we're having trouble getting those coaches, which yes. then support having these numbers. Exactly. exactly. Because out of the seven clubs, it looks like we are more than most of them, but can't, can't keep you coaches mm -hmm. you need it. Yeah, and just as a reference, um, the fall soccer season, the K through four is about 10 to 11 weeks. And then the um, grades five through 12 is 10 to 12 weeks, depending on what tournaments they're in. Any questions on the after school program? Yes. Yeah, I think given um, inflation and difficulties with staffing, it makes sense that we need to increase our rates, but um, just being mindful of where we lie, you know, obviously we're kind of closer to the Mill Valley Tiburon pricing, but, you know, we just, um, I think it's good timing to, to get the scholarship program going with this increase, I guess. Any other questions on soccer before we move on? No, I mean, I would just say it's roughly a 15% increase in taking into account inflation. I think that's perfectly fair. Uh, also, I, I'm not sure if we've uh, looked into it, but I know, um, you know, there is a lot of volunteer participation in the soccer leagues and still reliant on that. But we do have professional assistance even in the rec to yeah. you know, have some full-time folks, which some of these other programs might not even have. That's correct. They, not all of them have them. Are the organizers of our of our club are very proud of the services and the program that they provide. And um, they're, they're helping us suggest to request a, a higher rate to just conference, compensate those people and retain them. So they've sought a lot of people leaving towards um, other clubs. So. Speaking from experience, they deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, do you wanna move on? Yeah. All right, let me scroll back. I want to get car sick here. Okay. So that was really the only change to the actual fee schedule. So that was attachment one and then attachment two. So if we go back to our staff report. Okay. So here we were at programs. That's the only program suggestion. Um, and then, uh, uh, I just wanted to make a note that staff uh, recommends not adding uh, Camp Corte Madera, the summer day camp at this time um, for the 2023-2024 uh, fiscal year. Uh, the program format is still evolving to meet community needs. And once the program format is consistent for a minimum of two years, then I would recommend us revisit um, adding that to the fee schedule. Um, permit fees, no changes, but I wanted to note that the staff is working to improve the application process of to obtain permits. And that's what I referenced with creating templates and remove and redoing the form so it can be filled out online and it just kind of gets that fresh update. And we're only collecting relevant information and we're illustrating that we need maps for closures and, and things that we've gotten that on the staff level. Once we get an application provided to us, we're like, hey, we needed this, this, and this, and it was there, but it just wasn't as clear as it should be. So efficiency. Much appreciated. And someone who's done a block party, those kind of, it's that kind of stuff makes it so much easier. Thank you. Absolutely. Because again, council's priority is to create our community and, you know, opportunities for our community to engage. And we want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can to support that. Um, and then no changes to section four, which was the resolution portion um, to reference to town civic organizations, large Puerto Madera school district, um, and their free use of the facility. Um, also, um, I wanted to note that um, Section 5 of the resolution, which refers to the discounted use of Parks and Rec uh, Department programs and facilities by employees of the town, um, Central Marine Police, and um, Central Marine Fire, um, staff recommends no change to the support of offering employees the benefit of the standard rate minus 25%. Um, and also staff recommends revisiting the benefit of attending the department's summer camp at a discounted rate in the future once the program format is established and those fees are added to the fee schedule. Uh, before it was at no cost to join the summer playground for family members of employees. And that's why I wanted to make sure that that was highlighted in there. 
Um, and in 2021, last time we revisited this, um, we noted that the following fee topics may be included in future fee discussions. Um, that was quarter meter football club, which we addressed, um, tennis court, uh, rental fees, basketball court, rental fees, and advertising in the printed activity guide. Um, everything besides the advertising has been addressed. Um, again, I didn't recommend tennis court or basketball um, at this time, just because it'd be able to facilitate the drop-in um, use of our, of our facilities by the community. Um, and then advertising in the printed activity guide, we need to evaluate why some agencies do and don't offer that. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, creating the criteria of what advertising would be appropriate, where you put it, whether you put it throughout the activity guide or whether you have a section in the back. There's a lot of different industry reasoning behind it. Um, new this year is um, to this staff report is the introduction of a diversity, equity, and inclusion element, and in consistent uh, with the town's um, uh, adoption and really motivation to um, to create more diversity, equity, and inclusion for the town is um, prioritizing DEI. And we created the scholarship program that was reviewed by Parks and Rec um, in September, and then also approved in council in October. And there's links to those presentations and discussion in the uh, staff report. And the intent of the Corte Madeira Recreation Scholarship Program is to offer scholarship opportunities to low and moderate income families in order for individuals to participate in the programming offered through the department. And the town's committed to providing quality, affordable recreation programs for everyone to enjoy. Um, the staff report provided um, to town council on October 18th introduced the scholarship program, and that's in, in attachment three, along with the program cover letter and applications, and that was an application for both youth and adults. Uh, staff report provides historical information on scholarships granted, donation sources, references to the summer 2022 grant for the Larkspur Port of Madeira School District summer school participants, and potential funding from town council following a, a future request during budget review. So again, we plan to um, ask the council for additional funding towards the scholarship program when we're reviewing the budget. Um, loosely, at the last meeting um, that I attended for town council, we threw out the number $10,000. So it's something that the commission will recommend when we get closer to that point. Um, also new to the staff report is the introduction of a cost recovery goal. Um, at the October 18th um, council meeting, um, council briefly discussed the former Parks and Recreation Department philosophy of breaking even and requested that the commission have a discussion at a future meeting to determine philosophy and relationship to equity and ensuring that programs and services remain affordable for our community. Um, the commission briefly discussed uh, the request at, their, at, our December, at our November 7th meeting, um, and then as an executive advisory committee with the mayor, chair, and vice chair, um, we did discuss and further clarify this request. And so following that meeting um, of the exec committee, um, staff has created the summary of the Parks and Rec Department review and expense of the cost recovery status from 2017 to 2022, and that's an attachment four. We can go to that if you want to. Be a long scroll. Don't have my mouse. Hopefully, it's helpful for anybody that's watching or watching later to have the actual <laughs> image up here. Um, so, here is an attachment four, and it's the Corner Meter Parks and Recreation Department revenue and expenses with cost recovery from 2017 to 2022, thanks to um, the collaboration of Daria, our finance director, and Rochelle. Um, so if you can see um, on the far right hand column is our percentage of cost recovery. So in 2017 to 18, it was about 41%, um, 2018, 19, 40, about 48%, and then 44. And then following COVID, the 2020, 2020 to 2021, we had 54. And then um, the last year, completed year, we had 87 and a half. So 2021, um, 2022 fiscal year, um, we saw a significant jump to 87 and a half percent. Um, I did an informal poll of our neighboring agencies to identify whether they had cost recovery um, direction. Um, we I went out to Marinwood Community Service District, um, City of Mill Valley, City of Novato, um, Tana San Anselmo, and the City of San Rafael. Um, and none of them had stated or direction. Um, a lot of them said that that's probably coming, um, said they had had previous experience with it, whether it be in that agency or outside of it. But interesting to know that um, Marinwood, the recreation department, so they're just recreation, parks is separate, 
um, has been able to recover about 80% in recent years. Um, and then uh, Mill Valley, um, their director, Sean, was really helpful as far as identifying a little bit more breakdown. Um, the recreation portion of their department is roughly about 75% of the direct and indirect costs, with the exception of the debt service on their community center building. Um, and then the cost recovery goal for the community center is 100%, he said, of the indirect and direct costs, with that exception of the debt service. Um, Novato anticipates coming in the future. And then Santa Fe said that they're um, developing a cost recovery goal as part of their master plan. And right now they're in the process of their master planning process. So looking at the cost recovery goals, um, really opening up for the, for the discussion of the commission and your advice, um, staff right now is suggesting not setting a cost recovery goal if we were to set one at more than 80%. Um, trying to be con, uh, conservative, just seeing how much that jumped up from the previous years and being responsible to not um, set a goal that we can't attain, um, but really wanted to kind of open it up. This is the first time we've talked about an actual cost recovery and seen the numbers. Um, so first, Ashley, I just want to applaud you and your entire department. This difference in the cost recovery rate over the last number of years is astounding. It is it is really impressive um, what we've been able to do both to grow the revenue and kind of keep expenses in line. Um, quick question on cost recovery goals. I have had a little bit more um, information having been part of the executive committee conversations, but the to clarify the cost recovery we are talking about is looking at kind of this 1.8 million total expenses budget and setting a percentage of that that we will aim to recover with our revenue. And that's before we get transfers from the general fund, correct? That's a great question. Um, I haven't thought that part of it. Okay. And the, the main part is I thought of the overall, a yeah. lot of the discussions with our neighboring agencies was um, clarification of whether we're that's like an overall cost recovery for the department. So the different divisions can balance each other out or whether it was going to be um, through everything. And my suggestion is an overall so that we still continue the, to balance. Open up to the other commissioners for comment or question. Well, I think it, uh, I, I mean, first, I think it's interesting of all of these agencies are kind of expected to operate without an understanding of if they're supposed to recover their cost or at how much. Um, but having been a part of this process from the beginning, we as a commission went from really not knowing any of the financials or any of the budgets um, to really, I think, having a good understanding of it. And um, when Todd Kuzumano came on, it was basically, you know, we've got to got to get our affairs in order and, and stop hemorrhaging money as a department, but to what extent? And that's where I think, you know, is, is our main goal to recover a certain amount of our cost? How do we balance that with serving the public? You know, this is where it might be good to have kind of a general goal. And if we come in way over that, then we sit back and look at it and say, where would we like to use this money to serve our community? Um, and that's kind of like the big picture. I think it would be good to have an understanding. I don't know what that number is though. And nothing has to be cited. I just really wanted to have the opportunity for the commission to, to discuss it and really consider this going forward. So we do get transfers from the general fund every year, and that has changed on what it is year to year. Right. Um, and so this there is at least ten thousand in here coming from the town. Correct. That this ten thousand for um, scholarships in what we're seeing here in terms of revenue. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what the what the transfer is on the, if you look at the form is the salary transfer. So that's positions like Ashley's and some of the ones that we have special tax for that pay for part of the person who does youth programs, part of the person who does senior programs. So that number, the salaries transfer is, is that is specific, like earmarked positions. What we didn't take last year was any deficit money because we didn't have a deficit. So that's the big difference. Moving forward, we're still going to get the transfer of salary. That's still, that's continuing. What's not going to continue 
we hope, is the deficit transfer. And so, you know, the trend for us the past few years was to take less and less and last year not have to take any, which was, I I was surprised, honestly, because you just never know. Um, and this year, you know, it looks good for us as well to not have to um, have any general fund deficit coverage as well. Uh, so it'll come from somewhere within the town if we are opt if we are not breaking even or coming close to it, if we're not hitting it close to a higher recovery goal. And then it it I have no transparency in where we would be taking that money from and what we're not able to do from a total town government perspective. But um I think this is the kind of in light of everything, can we operate and can we use this cost recovery target to help us set things like the fee schedule? Um, because it becomes a bit of a circular argument without some understanding or some intent to recover costs um, based on that fee schedule. And so I think that's what um, why these two things kind of play together. I like a target. I like goals. Yeah, I think that helps. But I also don't want to set it too high to fail. Right. I mean, you don't want to go to 90? No, close. not today. Okay. I thought about it in the drafting. And then yeah, when I got the like feedback a, from, be a big from outside, I was like, maybe we're ambitious. Let's just see how the budget settles out for three years after post COVID and see, yeah. go from there. Good. So maybe we just talk about it and maybe we suggest that the, com the commission consider setting a goal after we have, you know, three healthy years following COVID. I think that's smart because given the volatility of everything with COVID and rising costs, setting a target right now seems kind of arbitrary. Sure. Because we're kind of just seeing our first year of solid programming, solid budgeting, mm -hmm. solid organization and management. And we're not 100% back. I mean, we still have a special cancellation policy tied to COVID where we, you know, processes and people are coming to events with masks on and the flu is raging and mm -hmm. everything else that we're, we're going through. But as of today, we are in a surplus. We're doing well. We're so doing far. well. So an 80% target sitting where we are with six months left in the year doesn't feel so crazy. No. Um, I think we can defer making an official, um, but it doesn't feel like setting an age to target. Given where we sit today, feels unachievable, um, which is, I think, incredibly exciting and something I should be very proud of. Um, so we should take this as a... Well, it's just, just a discussion. Um, I might recommend the commission that we continue to have this element included in the staff report when we discuss the fees, just as a framing of mind as we go through the fees, free fee study mm -hmm. um, and fee schedule. And at some point, we'll have the commission make a decision that we're ready to set a goal. Perfect. The thing, so we will track it. Yes, and we'll it's, track it. And hope for it. And we'll make it official <laughs> in the future. Yes, Keep on track. exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Anything else in the fee schedule that we need to address today? Um, we'll just go through that um, for the fiscal impact. There's no um, direct fiscal impact associated with the review and discussion tonight. Um, and then that there's uh, no fiscal impact also associated with the staff recommendation to include the fees for um, the recreational soccer league um, because the expenses, because the fees are based on the expenses of running the program and benchmarked against the comparable programs. Um, just a note that I did add the work plan segment on here. Um, and that's something that we see on our council agendas and introducing it to the commission as well as this item is related to council priority category number one, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and then no environmental impact. And the options tonight is recommend a resolution um, to be decided uh, XXX 2023, uh, formalizing a revised park and recreation fee schedule for fiscal years 2023, 2024 to town council for possible adoption or two recommend with modifications or three provide di additional direction to staff. So the only action item I'm asking of the commission tonight is if you recommend um, the proposed resolution with adding just the recreation soccer league fees. Can, can I ask one question about the proposed resolution? Um, in section five, it talks about the 25% discount for town employees and central Marin police and fire. Have we ever considered extending that to Corte Madera Larkspur school district employees? I don't think we've talked about it as an action item, but happy to facilitate discussion. 
I was just thinking about people who work in our community, who do a lot for our community and could probably really benefit from that. Um, so that would be great to consider as an action item in the future. Right. It, could, it could be considered for a future or we also have addressed an opportunity with the scholarship. Um, so again, that's kind of a, a double way. Um, but if the commission would like to discuss it at this meeting or make a note to include it in discussion for uh, next year, for next fiscal year, take whatever direction you'd like to go. I, I like the idea of supporting our teachers. I'm trying to wrap my head around um, my desire to support with like, do we have any evidence we need to do it? Or has there been request for it? I think we just had one, I think we had one reference of a request when we were talking about priority registration, when we first started COVID and the teachers came back to school um, and bringing their kids with them for our, our after school program, or essentially at that time it was all day support. Um, but that's the only reference that I'm aware of. Do we know what it would mean from a cost perspective? Like if 80% of our participants were teachers? I don't know. So maybe worth looking into for next Good. year. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it would be something, I'm not sure if any of the commission members, our uh, commissioners have um, connections with the PTO or PTAs and they could put that um, question out through those networks to see if there's a, a need. And Sarah, just to clarify, is your um, suggestion for teachers who have students who are currently within the school districts here, not just teachers who have students elsewhere, or do you mean for all? That's a good question. Um, I, f I think if they are a teacher in the district, they are serving our community. And if you look at the teacher salary schedule and um, compared to the cost of living in this county, and what they do for our local community because they are teaching the children of our specific sure. community. I think it would be a very um, nice thing to offer them and probably actually very much appreciated. Yeah, I think realistically in terms of impact, the sharing the after school programs, it will likely be isolated to those who have students who are in the district for for the purpose of it being easy right? right immediately after school it may be different for the summer offerings um or school break offerings that might be a larger group but i suspect the impact probably wouldn't be that large um for those who particularly for the majority of the year i think it's a great idea yeah and for those who don't know if you teach in the district and live somewhere else, your children can attend school at, at that school. So um, there are a number of teachers who live in other cities, but teach in our schools and their children also attend our schools. So I guess um, the options are to either talk about it tonight and get it in this fee schedule for this year or to wait and try to get it in the fee schedule for next year. The one option, too, is you can make modifications to the staff recommended resolution. Yeah. Um, I support moving forward with it. I mean, I think it's a it's a wonderful idea. Um, I, I know plenty of teacher parents that have their kids. I've coached them and offering them uh, assistance. I think it's a fantastic idea. So I'd recommend um, adjusting the fee schedule. Shannon, Emily. Yep. Yeah. All right. We're in agreement. So how would you suggest wording that? Ah. <laughs> well, I'd like to make I sure to capture your feet. Under the list of section five. Yes. Okay. Um, it would be also um employees of the school district. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Employees. Well, I think we need to clarify employees or full-time teachers or I mean extended to but, all staff. I mean, it, it, I don't have a personal opinion. It just that's a different um amount of people for sure. Yeah, I think that that's a good question because there are a lot of people who do part time teaching with the school district for various reasons. So I think we we what about full time employees? Um, because then it covers um, classified staff like our mm -hmm. secretaries and our um, 
you know, facilities, people. Yeah, I think, I think to start this, I think it's reasonable to, particularly in the first year of implementing this, extend it to full-time employees. And then we can really evaluate the impact and decide whether it's reasonable to extend it beyond that. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay. And it's of the, of the schools. I don't know if we have any administrative district people. Uh, We're thinking about of the school school district, right in the schools. Well, and, but the administrators are also employees of the school, right? Principals and whatnot, but there's only a handful of them. There's well, one. I think we also need to, is this speaking or, only to the elementary and junior high school, like Clark, well, yeah, you know, Clark Coven Hall or extended to Redwood? Not to Redwood. They're different school districts. Yeah. They're a different school district yes. and they're a different town. Um, but well, include, but like, it's the superintendent, of but Hall. Yeah. I mean, there's only one. Right. Yeah, right. right. I, I just don't um, know if there are, when we talk about naming it, this is my question. We say all full-time staff of our school, the school district, if our intent is to keep it to the people who work in those buildings, I'm going to look at you and really like, if, I don't know if there are other administrators beyond those buildings that we want to include or not include. Well, so the Larkspur Cordomadera School District is the superintendent, mm-hmm. the um, principal Shaw, who mm-hmm. I would like to, you know, I would think should be included. Yep. Um, so it'll be all school administration for um, Neil Cummins, the Cove, and Hall. And Hall. Yeah, just those. I think that's right. Yeah. So, but yeah. full time employees of the school district includes all of them and the classified and the certificate um, staff. And then thinking about it now, if part time employees also need help, there is now the scholarship program, which could help capture those people. So what I'm hearing from the commission discussion is that we want to offer to full-time employees of the Larkspur Corner Midair School District included then in the list in section five. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. And then possibly to uh, Commissioner Koenig's um, suggestion, possibly in the future review, also extending that um, offer to part-time. Correct. Right. Noted. And then I think as we think about yeah, um I think it's more, I love this. So not to get me wrong, but like how do we think about making these decisions is we're making it mm-hmm. very instinct based. And so I don't know how we might in the future get kind of information as to whether, you know, how big of a population are we talking about? What would that impact to our fee schedules in the future would be kind of a good way to think about how we start to extend these um, so that we know that we're having the impact that we want to be having. Um, well, and that's that big picture balance we were just talking about. Like what is our mission statement to serve the community versus fiscal responsibility and solvency. So that's that kind of big picture question, you know, and I guess um, getting some of that information so we know exactly what we're proposing is helpful. Yeah. Well, I think we're setting that, we're setting the goal of trying to be fiscally responsible right. and kind of self-sustaining as a department right. or or more self-sustaining, right? We're not completely independent. Um, I think what's unclear to me as we, as we make these, and it was true even of the, you know, the, the fire staff, I don't, I don't know how many police officers and fire staff right. we have and, and what, whether it should be a 25% discount or a 50% discount, like these are, it's just hard to know. And I think my point is, as we figure these things out, as we start to get better understanding of um, our proposals that we know that it's going to impact enough people, right? That it's a big enough population um, and that we can afford to support that population. And um, it might be good just to get that information in our July meetings so we can really yeah. see how many discounts we gave out and how much of an impact it was. And yeah, that's a great suggestion. That might, I don't know if that's a possibility as we get towards the end of the year and mm-hmm. recap, if we are able to see the number of discounts that we gave out. I'll have to- figure out if there's a way to run a report for discounts because right now that's manually done in our system per person. And I, I'm only aware of maybe five families at most that are utilizing the the minus 25% and that's just employees. Okay. I think it's also a benefit that's um, not only underutilized, but maybe under known, unknown. That's yeah. totally fair. That yeah, I was definitely going to say, I mean, do people know that this benefits there? Is that well advertised and people are new to the Department, you know, it, I think this is maybe going to 
this is nice that if we're making a change, we might be able to spread the word a little bit wider um, and capture the people who have had this extended to them previously and didn't even know about it while including the new the new school district employees. Mm -hmm. And just a, a last uh, caveat is something to consider for a future time is creating a, a percentage cost escalator for our child care program. So that's something to consider going forward also, just so that we're not constantly rechanging all of the, the fees and having the same discussion, but we'll go through it next year and then close that. Speaking up, so the end of the scholarship, program is very, very new and sort of piggybacking on this idea of do people know to ask for the 25%? Do we have, are there, have there been any applications for the scholarship yet? Tim, you've received a couple of requests for the forms. Um, we have received a couple of requests. Um, we have the mostly from childcare right now because they are in the program. We anticipate a bunch coming for summer when summer goes out and then I'll be advertising the summer guide. So once they see that, that's when our most of our guides, our requests will come in. And then how do people know to request it? Is it put on the front of the packets if you need assistance or is that where it usually is? There's a full packet and there's also a link on the website. Yeah. And then the goal, I think from, I think it was a commission direction. It might've been council also is that when we put out marketing is that we have um, that, that note on the bottom. That's what I thought. And okay. then it's on a registration form that there's a scholarship opportunity. They can check it for more information. So something to add to our update, our, um, our registration forms. Because for me, that's sort of the only um, so I had two questions about the resolution. Um, one was I just wanted to confirm that attachment A, the packet, is what's intended to be exhibit A to the resolution. Um, let's be more specific. I got papers everywhere. Sure. Attachment <laughs> sure. A is on page 5A of our packet tonight. I think attachment A was sorry, attachment of, one is meant to be exhibit A for the resolution. Are those they're referring to the same thing. I'm just yes. Kidding. So uh, so in attachment one, we've got the proposed resolution. We've got the fee schedule and the resolution. The resolution is Exhibit A, right? Well, so then within the resolution, it identifies an Exhibit A to the resolution, which I think that's the fee schedule. The first that's two the pages. Yeah. Okay. I just, that's what yeah, I just that's wanted the to make spreadsheet. Sure. Okay. So that was my question: is whether those first two pages were Exhibit A? Yes. So yes. Um, and then I think we all talked about we're going to amend section five to extend to the LCM, uh, LCM district full-time employees. And then I was wondering if there was any appetite to um, add in a very short section just referencing the scholarship program. And the only reason is, and maybe it's just optics, is that anytime you're increasing fees, like we've talked about here, our intention of, hey, we've increasing fees, but we also have these avenues if it's not available to folks. I'm just wondering if it's if it's a, a place that we might want to bundle those things together. Like we've got where these fees are staying, these are increasing, you know, these are discounts here, and a reference just to the fact that we have the scholarship program. If that's something that's worthwhile, just a very short one sentence addition. I don't know. Maybe I'm being overly yep. driven by the optics of sure. it. I just thought. What do you? Would anybody else think that's a? Because we've all mentioned it in this yeah, context. Like, oh, well, there's this program. Yeah, nice suggestion. Yeah. So I, I believe we are in a position now where we could um, make a motion to approve with edits and give Ashley the, the freedom to do those edits and, sure. and move forward. Do we have a motion to approve with edits? I would make that motion. Can you have a second? I would second. Rebecca, can we get a vote, please? We did not open it up to public comment. Would you please open it up to public comment? <laughs> Let me just check real quick and see if we have any emailed public comment. Um, we did receive one emailed public comment from Patty Stolier, who asks, did staff find in the research that many senior programs are cost-free in other towns? Um, and that was the only emailed public comment. And let me just go back to the Zoom and see if there are any attendees with raised hands. And there are no attendees with raised hands. To address that, not, that's not part of what we were asking our neighboring agencies. So we don't have any details on that.
Let's try it. Round Thank you. Two. Ready for round two? All right. A motion to approve with edits. I'll make that motion. We have a second. Can we get a vote, please? Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Elsid. Yes. Commissioner Kettig. Yes. Commissioner Phipps. Commissioner Rose. Yes. Commissioner Blumling. Vice Chair Charlie. And Chair Miles. Yes. Thank you. All right. On to business item number two, um, ad hoc subcommittee reports, which I believe may be short. Um, and jumping into the pool research, we have not done um, moved the pool research forward, um, but we're enlightened by this conversation around budgets um, and our conversation with um, the mayor about kind of how, how we might um, go about um, even funding something as expensive as our own pool. Um, and so I want to follow up with him and council and get a little bit more information about um, if we were to go after building our own facility, where would that type of funding priority fall within town council to understand if it is something that in the current environment makes any sense for us to continue to pursue if it's kind of a non-starter from an expense perspective. So I will take that on and come back to uh, the commission in January with some understanding as to whether we are kind of stalled on a pool due to funding. Any updates on athletic fields research? Yeah, I've got a quick update. Um, <clears throat> so uh, apologies for the delay, but I was able to reach out to the folks at uh, Tiburon to dig into some numbers, uh, McKeggie Field. Um, so after combing through lots and lots of paperwork, I was able to kind of put together um, a list, which I'm happy to share whatever protocol is with that. But just um, as kind of an overall, um, they received multiple bid, uh, uh, bids uh, for the construction, which was anywhere from 1.2 to 1.4. Um, who, the team that won the bid was about 1.3, yeah, it was about 1.4. There was additional expenses and they did have some uh, unforeseen costs. For instance, there's a very large pitch, um, which they had to level as well as uh, they discovered that the underlying layer was, um, they wanted to improve it to include sand, which is very, very costly, um, which most likely we would not incur. There may be other expenses that you know we don't know about yet. But um, all in, when I say all in, I mean 10% uh, contingency, Marin Municipal Water District metering, upgrades, equipment, construction management, all of that, um, it came out to be a little over $2 million. Uh, um, that is what, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a professional by no means, um, but that's a pretty good field, best in class, uh, and what you can expect, you could probably take some of it off because of the additional expenses um, that they did incur, but uh, yeah, that's about what we look. And then again, just for everybody at home, this is not artificial turf. This is natural uh, and a much larger uh, section too as well. Standard is about, I believe, 90,000 square feet. This was 120. My apologies, it might be off a little bit, but it's a much, much larger section mm -hmm. if you've ever driven by it on the king. It's, it's a big field. And Tim, did they give you any, in, any um, indication as to kind of the maintenance cost? Do, do they have full-time staff that manage this grass? They they do, and they budget it, and it's and it is quite large. I I, I want to I don't have it written down, so my apologies, but I want to say it's about twenty five to thirty five uh, a year. Okay. Um, and the other th the other thing I did want to mention in budgeting, they were very creative. They wanted to get community su support, so they did reach out to the Tiburon Soccer Clubs, Lacrosse, and a few others, and they were able to get about four hundred k um raised for the project which made it a little bit more feasible which was a very clever idea is a lot of people are very supportive of field improvements um so you know it wouldn't hurt to, to look at you know possible opportunities there okay. and they are able to play on it year round mm -hmm. yes so it doesn't seem that the upfront cost is much different than what we talked about with artificial turf we're still talking in the two million zone yeah artif artificial was a bit more though wasn't it it was um i think three three three, three um oh, up okay. front yes and then um eight hundred thousand every 10 years to resurface mm -hmm. plus there was other maintenance um there's special testing you have to do for safety standards and then you have to actually roll the field a couple times a year to redistribute the undersurface, and I don't have a cost for that. Okay. Um, and did we get any perspective on safety of artificial versus natural? No, I need to look into that. 
Um, this is, you know, again, it's not a $20 million pool, um, but it's not fitting within our budget. Um, we're not going to get that 20% cost recovery. So I think I can add this to my conversations with the mayor of kind of if we had a smaller line item and we wanted to invest in field maintenance, what that might look like um, from a town support perspective um, financially in that investment. But between what you've been able to research, is there a point of view that you all have created between our options for creating an, um, a year round field? I um, was surprised by the uh, every 10 year upkeep required for turf. It's not that you put it in once and it's a done deal. Um, also from an environmental impact, I personally like not having um, the, the chemical exposure and the plastic. And I think a lot of people in this community would probably feel the same, but that's um, just a, a hunch. But I was surprised by the, the recurring upkeep cost, which then actually swayed me personally more towards natural grass. Um, I think for me, I've been trying to keep a, an unbiased opinion on it. Um, I, I, I've got pros and cons to both. I was very surprised at some of the negative effects of the artificial turf safety. Um, I have read uh, a number of articles that people have uh, shared with me. Um, it is a concern. There's a lot of NFL players that have really come out um, aggressively, um, you know, saying, you know, that it's 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 not really a great condition. And we're talking about our kids. So it's definitely of concern. Um, the heat effect uh, can be significant with a 90,000 square foot place for neighboring areas. So that is of concern during the hot summer months. Um, there is a lot of resistance and reluctance that uh, folks in Tiburon were. They didn't really even pursue artificial turf just because of the outspoken folks, which um, I uh, I know there's quite a few of in Quotum Dare and Larkspur, and I would think that we definitely need to be take a more aggressive stance with reaching out to the community to see, you know, what what the community is feeling. Is there are some strong feelings both directions. Any other commissioners on that? Based on what you've learned, I I think I'll probably echo okay. a lot of those, those feelings. I mean, I I, I came in with my own sort of gut and then I've just put that aside and then been listening. And I think I am leaning towards uh, not artificial turf, but um, for the reasons that you just mentioned, this doesn't seem to be better. There's mm -hmm. a other issue with it. And then there seems to probably be a lot of resistance in the public. And it seems to be much more expensive. So if it can be done um, cheaper, safer, less artificial way, then that seems like a lot of John, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing you guys. Um, yeah, first of all, Commissioner Rose, thank you for gathering that information from Tebron and Commissioner Elson for the research you did. I um, will be honest. I was initially uh, very um, naive about what the options were. And um, I'm happy to hear about the natural turf option that happens to be less expensive and I think will be more pleasing to the community as a whole. Um, my hope is it would it would please those who are aiming for artificial turf, who maybe like me didn't know that there was such a good natural option out there. So um, I think we as a commission have a responsibility to do what the community most wants. I think field improvement is, is well supported. And if we can find the way that is um, favors the most community members, we're we're best off that way, and sounds like it may be the natural turf option. So, I think we are all in agreement, and I appreciate um, the research that we've done here on the athletic field. So, I will take this um, kind of understanding to um, to my into my conversations, and just ask um, the mayor about what this might look like from a budget perspective and that we are looking at a natural option of field improvements and what we really want is some budget to invest in um, some, some significant um, and meaningful field improvements that we believe are going to be more, you know, will appeal to both the athletes, um, the sports teams, as well as the neighbors who would like to avoid artificial. And I think with that, it's very exciting. And maybe wraps our first wrap of our first ad hoc subcommittee we ready to declare that committee complete. Thanks. Oh, well done.
All right. I'm sure um, there will be more feedback from the conditions assessment as well. So it's great. Keep an open mind. Yes. Yeah. Um, do we need to vote on business items to close them or open for public comment? Um, I am not seeing any raised hands from online attendees though, and we did not receive any emailed public comments. That's it. All right. Staff updates and commissioner reports. Okay. This will be a quick summary since we've talked about so much of our achievements um, already in our presentations. Um, but our active older adult programs and activities through Rec Inc. and Aaron Duggan. Um, our, sorry, our active older adults are going uh, through Perry. Um, we've got a number of different programs. Like we saw, we've got something every week, if not two things every week. And one of the highlights is that we have the return of the in-person lunches on Thursday at noon. Um, we also have bingo back. Um, we're also working on a beginner's um, bridge. So not only do we continue the intermediate, but we're also getting more feedback and more participation in the, uh, the beginners. So hopefully that'll help um, broaden that uh, attendance levels. Um, Coordinator Children's Club uh, or Children's Club Children's Center. Again, the registration opens on the 20th of every month uh, for the next month. So December 20th opens for January. Um, they are doing a phenomenal job. And again, my, my monthly invitation to come and view uh, what their facility looks like. It's utilizing the portable trailers over at Neil Cummins and both Alex and Alex are doing a phenomenal job with not only creating a great program and curriculum and activities and engaging and training new employees, um, but decorating and creating a space that's really welcoming and super clean. Like I, I, <laughs> I would like to have my house as clean <laughs> as their stuff considering the amount of kids that go through there. Um, they're really great. Um, after school enrichment classes, as you saw through the budget, Erin um, Duggan is really excelling at her relationships with the instructors, creating um, a curriculum that has very broad interests and engaging some of our community um, children and youth that not only um, might have been traditionally missed, say our tweens classes and our programming is on Friday and Saturday, um, but right now she's got a really good um, diversified program. And those relationships with um, having opportunities on campus at Neil Cummins and Cove are um, extremely valuable. And we really appreciate that opportunity. Um, again, with Erin, the Adults with Development Disabilities, that's Rec Inc. Um, they have something, you know, a couple times a month. Um, they're always looking for family volunteers. So if you want to participate in that, um, again, they're they're really excited for their in-person holiday dance um, photos with Santa. Santa makes the cameo. If you remember last year, they did a Zoom dance um, and everyone's welcome to attend. Um, so really, really looking forward to that. And that's at the community center. Um, our community events um, closing out this year, we do have the closing of the art uh, reception. So the art reception is going on right now. Hopefully you'll stop by and check it out, uh, not only for the adults, but for the 16 winners of the Painted Bins poster contest. Um, we also have the family um, workshop for um, the gingerbread house decorating. That's with Christina. Um, and then if you have any um, youth that would like to send a letter to Santa, we've got an express postal service. They also get um, a letter back, uh, North Pole News. It's got some activities and just some news from North Pole. It's really nice. Um, but that deadline's coming up. So we need to be able to receive those so that we can help facilitate getting that North Pole News back to those writers. Um, and then coming up to our park issues and concerns, I did reach out to code enforcement um, and we had a response um, just in general that they've seen a decrease in issues in the park from prior times. Um, typically, um, we have one of the code enforcement um, staff drive through the parking lots about two to three times a day. And on occasion, um, they talk to a dog owner about dogs off leash. Um, they still get uh, regular text messages from neighbors during off hours about dogs in the canal or um, off leash, though. So that's a continuing problem, but generally in the off hour, so outside of our regular business hours. And um, they're happy to come and talk at our January meeting. They just weren't available in person tonight. Um, a scholarship program. If we want to facilitate that, make sure that we get that information out. Um, Tim's collecting um, applications now, and we're going to be putting it on um, our collateral so that people are more aware of it. Again, one of our motivations was creating a more transparent opportunity uh, for people to apply, not only with the uh, the cover letter, but the applications that can be e more easily completed um, 
but then also going out for donations. Uh, tis the season for donations. So not only can community service groups um, from Corte Madeira, but reaching out to Larkspur also um, and individuals, like we mentioned during the scholarship um, presentation that um, some of the teachers had requested the opportunity to support some of the students at their school. So they had somewhere to go after school and, and continue that, um, that supervision, knowing what that impact is to the families to not have to end their workday early to, to do supervision. Um, spring activity guide preview. Um, we should have that activity guide out um, before the holiday season. We're working on it um, this week. Hopefully it'll go to print and then usually it's at the printer for about two weeks. Um, and that'll be everything from January through May. And then we'll be starting in end of January, we'll be playing in the summer one. So that'll be all of our activities and events for the season. Hopefully again, the, the movie nights and music and some other activities. We're always open for some suggestions. Um, you guys are usually the recipients of some community feedback. If people are coming up to you and saying, Hey, it'd be really great if we had this event or, Oh, it'd be great if, you know, you know, the neighboring agency over here has this program. That's really amazing. And we'd love to have it here. That's the kind of feedback that we can really work with and start researching and get implemented in our area. Um, and that's about it for me. Um, Rebecca, by way of protocol or maybe Ashley, um, uh, Madam Vice Chair pointed out that we didn't vote on removing the athletic fields research subcommittee or our decision to move forward recommending a natural turf investment. Do we need to do that? Or no, I, the, the point was I wanted to just confirm that we had not taken any official action with respect to the fields. All we did right. was just, just say that there's yeah, just sure. discussion, that there was no additional assignments right now, and that you were going to sort of take the fruits right. of that yeah. research and take it, yes, and talk, but that it, we have not voted Decided. on we one or the voted. other. So yes. it's clear because because it's not agendized for a vote, so we right. did not. Right. Okay, <laughs> great. Agendized for discussion only, no yeah. action. You agendized Sorry. for discussion. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if that's just one. Um, and with that, we'll go back to the commissioner reports. And do we have November updates from town council? Um, yes, so I, I spoke uh, regarding the first November town council meeting at our previous meeting, but um, in regards to the November 15th town council meeting, there really was nothing relevant um, to Parks and Rec. Um, the majority of the conversation was regarding parklets, um, as well as the SB9 lot split um, bill that was out. So nothing really relative to us. Great. Um, the December meetings haven't happened, so I have no update there yet. Um, the Executive Advisory Committee did meet to um, discuss budgets, cost recovery, the scholarship program, and our fee schedule to ensure that we were um, thoughtful and equitable about that process. And we have brought kind of that full discussion here tonight. Um, so nothing in addition to what we've talked about. And I do not have an individual commissioner update. Any other individual commissioner updates? No, yeah, just the only, um, I've been getting some feedback from the public on the website and difficulty registering for classes. Um, and also how uh, I think it was maybe cheerleading where it was said, it or a tennis or some class said it will open for registration on this date, but it was actually open before so by the time the registration date came, the class was already full. So just to pass on, I hear a lot of frustration from people around the website and the registration process. We can speak to um, the registration process. So that's separate from our town website. So just to clarify that, um, and that's through RecPro. And we've recently been going through um, a new migration for with our software or with our server. And there have been glitches that attach to it. So not only glitches attached to that, but then also on RecPro's side, they've been having some glitches. So we understand uh, some of the feedback that you received, at least in the last two weeks, particularly. Yeah. Um, so that has been a challenge. And then some of our emails have been bouncing back lately with our regular email. So we're working through it. You can just help help people have patience and give us a call if you have any challenges. We'd be happy to walk people through it. I did have one suggestion from the public related to childcare during um, assessment weeks. 
when the school is closing <laughs> early to be able to, um, you know, the kindergartners in particular get to get that extra hour so that they are now at the same schedule. But if the childcare could run a half day program to the three o'clock, so it could get kids to that time they normally pick up, um, that would be a big help for the parents who don't need it all the way till six, but it'd be great on those weeks that are closing early that extra 90 minutes a day um, would be welcome. And it's assessment weeks and conference weeks. There's, and there's quite a few days that that happens. When it, yeah, whenever it closes before three. Um, yeah, I, I think it's fair. And some of them are particularly hard because I think it's the entire week before the entire week of Thanksgiving off. And I know a lot of people struggle with that. I actually, and just to highlight that, I agree wholeheartedly. Often during those conference weeks, parents are meant to be in conference with the teacher without the child, but then there's no real clear answer of where a child goes. And if they're young, they can't just play on the yard by themselves. So, yeah. So, yeah, if, we, if it, just child centered is open. It'd be great. Uh, they are open. Yes. They just aren't open for that partial. They're day. open for yeah, the, for the okay. full closure. Yeah, for. Yeah. But so you're the what I'm hearing is that you're saying like a separate fee that just goes until three with the which is the regular end of a school day. Yes, correct. Any other updates? All right, moving on to routine and other matters. Um, are there any agenda, potential future agenda items that we would like to add to the agenda? I don't think so. If I heard correctly, someone, we're getting an update in January about what's going on with the dog, because I know it's, the dog stuff is very important to folks. That was January? Yes. So January, um, I believe Mike is going to be able to come and give us a, an update. So Mike Moriarty, our code enforcement and communications manager. Um, and then hopefully we'll also have two, at least a couple of designs from public restroom company review. Good stuff. Ad hoc committee assignments. We will re re um, release you from your obligation and the ad hoc. Are there any ad hoc topics that we want to take on here in December or take a breath and wait for the new year? I'm in favor of the breathing. Yeah. yeah. I think I think it's the time of year to take a breath. Um, and then items for review. These are our future agenda items. Any changes? Typically for January, it's just um, confirming what our meeting schedule is, looking at our holidays in advance. And then um, I believe... Uh, uh, once we have met with council with our strategic planning and department heads, then we'll be able to come back with uh, more information about the work plan and direction for the year. Okay. That might not be until February. All right, before we close, are there any topics the commissioners would like to put on future agendas? Last call. Excellent. I'm on deck for the December meeting. There's nothing else. We will close this meeting. Thank you so much for your attendance and participation.